Drivers. Today, I have the honor and pleasure of welcoming Dr. Wendy Koss, who is Assistant Research Professor and Director of the Purdue Animal Behavior Corps. Wendy has over 15 years of research experience in academia, industry, and also at the National Institute of Mental Health. Wendy, thank you so much for coming to the program and telling us a little bit about improving translational value in animal behavior tests. Thank you, Tommy. Um, as Tommy said, I'm Wendy Koss. I um, have a, a, a kind of a long history when it comes to where I've been, so I'll spare you the time. But I, did, I have worked, and you'll see some data from 2004 from when I was at in, um, Indianapolis School of Medicine, Indiana School of Medicine. Um, that's where I got my master's degree. Um, today, I'm going to talk about animal behavior tests and uh, a little bit about how we can improve or um, and how new and exciting um, technologies are happening in, um, in testing behavior. I, um, I am going to tell you a lot of little stuff that may seem trivial, but in the animal behavior world, little things really matter. So just keep that in mind as I go through. I am the director of the Behavior Corps, and I just wanna tell you a little bit about our Behavior Corps facilities. I'm not the only one. Um, Katie Fisher, who is on the call, she is the director of the IU School of Medicine um, Behavior Corps, and we are both experts at behavior and we validate, standardize, and develop new technologies in our core. We, um, we give our users a facility, a range of behavior equipment to use. So this is, um, so you don't have to purchase it in, to get it into your lab. You can try something new. Um, we provide training and research design help and we perform entire studies. Uh, the research design help is something that I do quite often, and that goes along with a lot of the things that are listed um, are going to be talked about here. There's little uh, details that are different from an in, in vivo than in vitro or even in ex vivo. Um, so it's it's important to to have these research design things in mind before you start your research your experiments. We make running behavior more efficient. It is slow. Behavior is not fast. Um, in fact, the best tests are, are some of the ones that take the longest. So we can speed this up by standardizing protocols and giving them to you, or we actually do all the work, right? Um, and a lot of our equipment is automated, which it may not be possible for your lab to get or have space in. So all of this would be beneficial to all the researchers that are interested um, in doing behavior studies. So, um, oh yeah, forgot to say the important one. The control, we, we control our environments and we test the environment. So we, we make sure our environments are the same all the time in the core. This sometimes can't happen in a laboratory, usually because of space. Um, I've known some people to run behavior in the middle of their laboratory. Um, it's not the best environment because things change readily. We have spaces that are dedicated for the instruments. So improving translational value in animal behavior. Today, I'm going to talk about some of the problems with translation um, from animal studies to drug discovery. I will tell you a little bit about how you can maybe approve your studies to kind of make them more translational. Um, it's uh, like I said, there's a lot of little things we can do, but also some development of new technologies that may help us in the future. Um, and these technologies may uh, change the whole landscape of animal behavior testing. Uh, which has been long overdue. Um, we have been using the same tests since sometimes 1920s and 30s, believe it or not. Um, this is like a, you know, a century. Um, so, you know, it's time for us to really invest in animal behavior. Uh, and it's really important to get that functional readout for drug discovery and, and be 
confident that that readout is valid. So the big number is 90%. And that is what people have been concentrating on when talking about animal testing and animal research or preclinical studies, whatever you want to call it, in drug trials. So this stat says that 90, there's a 90% failure rate with the translation of drugs from animal testing to human treatments. That's huge. Now, this is everything, right? 30% of it is just toxicity problems. So it's toxic in humans and not in animals. We are a different species. We have different GI systems, everything like that. Efficacy, which is more like what we're concerned with. And um, poor drug properties or poor strategic planning. This is all um, due to, um, to uh, uh, variability that we we really can't control in our basic science that we do in academia. So um, why should we care? So we are basic scientists. We create the, the, uh, the kind of foundation of what our drugs are gonna be in the future. The experiments we do now may, uh, may, uh, bridge an idea for a drug in the future that gets through clinical trials. And so these first, first studies should be validated and good. It should be good science. We all want to do good science. Um, bad research always slows progress. And I don't mean bad research. I just mean research that not everything has been considered in the interpretations. This this will also increase efficiency. Like I said, we're the foundation. So if we increase that efficiency, it should go to the drug should go to clinical trials and get to the patient quicker. We also have scientific integrity, which I don't need to talk about. Everyone knows um, what scientific integrity is. And um, some of these problems can be fixed. And it's mainly um, just pay attention to what you're testing. And make sure you are testing what you want to test. That sounds simple, but it's sometimes not. So I, um, so first of all, why do we have a lack of translation? Well, there's a lot of ideas out there. One is that there's too many factors. So we're only testing one small factor of a disease and we need a drug that does a lot or we need kind of a, a different drugs to be given at the same time and we don't usually test that. We test one factor, one part of the disease and we make treatments that will fix that. A perfect example of this is Alzheimer's disease. We know now that Alzheimer's disease has way, so many different factors. It has immune system factors, it's got inflammation, and it's got your plaques and tangles. Now, the newer drugs, some of them have been attacking the plaque load. When they do that, they found some improvement with the plaques um, or decrease in plaques. However, it, it wasn't very, uh, it's not very functionally um, valid. So in those drug studies before approval, before approval, because there's a lot of things that have been going wrong with these drugs after approval, I won't get into that. But before approval, um, they were only like 43% effective in reducing deficits in cognition. Um, and that is even worse in females. Um, actually, those drugs only help 13% of the women in, that have Alzheimer's disease and cognitive deficits, which is another thing I'll be talking about um, in that sex differences. So, so there's a lot of different factors here. So we might want to look at actually combining models. And, and the, an example of this would be an AD transgenic model and maybe something that causes inflammation. So seeing how we can work with that. We over rely on one outcome measure. Um, sometimes we need to have multiples. Sometimes we need to make sure that multiples or the multiple outcome measures are in the same paper, in the same publication, in the same experiment. 
Um, so this would be multiple different ways of looking at a problem. So if one person does electrophysiology, um, let's get some function reading maybe with that electrophysiology so that we know that we're actually uh, measuring something that is affecting something um, and this is not just in behavior, this is with all kinds of other um, methods. So a multi-method approach, I think, my personal opinion, is best. Um, we also have a lack of repro repro reproducibility in um, a lot of our experiments, but it's very poor in animal behavior studies. There's a lot of variables going on, in which I'll, I'll give you some information about some, but um, this causes a lot of re reproducible um, problems, which can it can it can hurt, right? Your your studies when you're doing drug discovery. Um, we have limitations in methods and models, and they are ignored. Perfect example of this is the AD transgenic models. A lot of people don't talk about their limitations. Um, for instance, one of the mice has a ton of plaques um, and actually it has shown that some of these explode, not explode, that's a bad word, but actually get way beyond the point of any human, you know, anything we've seen in humans. In fact, there's so many plaques that it presses on the neurons, which causes even more deficits. And these deficits are not what's happening in the human. So we need to make sure it's not that those models aren't good, it's that we just need to know what those limitations are so we keep them in mind when making those interpretations. There is a limited construct and predictive validity for a lot of animal models and animal behavior. You have to realize what is valid and why your interpret interpretation is right. Um, and we'll discuss all of these different kinds of validity um, in a moment. We also want to mention poor research design. And uh, this is basically your, your usual research design, like comment, right? Put your controls in there. Um, a lot of times in, in drug companies, they don't include a wild type control or uh, uh, they'll have a non-treated control, right? A fecal group and then a test group for their drug, but they won't actually test their model. So they'll use a transgenic model, but they won't trust it versus wild type. These, need, these are the things that need to be included in experiments, even though it takes more money, it takes more time, more animals. Sometimes these are just things that we have to do to um, increase translation and have better data. So what can we do? What do we need to know? Um, I'm gonna first start with these simple things. So you need to know who your animal is. You can't just think the animal is like, uh, you know, something in a laboratory bench. The animal is a whole individual. It has different behaviors. It, it, it is affected in different ways for different things. There's a lot more variation that you have to deal with. You have to watch your animal during behavior. You know, does it look like you're measuring what you're supposed to measure? A very good example of this is my, I'll tell you about my touch screens um, and later on in the talk, but I have done a paired association learning test. It's a learning test that's, that's a, kind of associated with Alzheimer's disease. I have two lines of AD models that the females uh, are looking completely not motivated to do the task. Um, this doesn't mean they have bad learning. The males actually learn just fine, but uh, the females will sit in a corner and not do anything. So there's this weird sex difference that I'm working on. But also, I know from watching those animals, they're that's not that's not that they're not learning. This is they're not doing anything. They're not trying. It's not that important. Or maybe they don't feel good. I don't know. But there's there's questions I've gotten from just looking at the animal and seeing how they're responding to the test. Um, what there are, you need to know what kind of variabilities 
there, that are sources of variabilities there are? Um, and can you eliminate them? So I, I tell my students that um, animal behavior is OCD. So you must be OCD to be a great behavioral person. You have to do everything the exact same way every time to get a good result. And a good result is decreased very small amount of variability because the power needed in animal behavior tests because of the variability just inside the animal, just individual variant variability in the animal, um, that is so high that you can't, you can't risk any other variability going on. Um, so environmental sounds, sometimes you can't, you, you can't control that, but there's other things you can control. You have to choose the right behavior test. First of all, you need to know what you're asking. You need to know a specific research question. Are you in a hypothesis? Are you expecting increases in memory or decreases in memory? So you should know that first so that you can pick your test um, correctly, because there's a lot of differences there. If you're looking for a deficit or you're looking for an enhancement, this does matter. Um, you need to have careful interpretation. So um, you have to know the confounds that are out there. This animal behavior is difficult, even though it sounds like it's simple. Um, anybody who has done behavior will tell you it's not, and mainly because the variability, but also confounds that you just don't know. I also tell my students to write down every little detail that's happening to the animals while testing. You never know what's going to be important. And pilot studies. So the best thing to do is a pilot study making sure your model is correct and working. Um, this sometimes gets skipped over because of time and money. This is why we have core facilities, so we can do that work and you can benefit from it. We pilot, like for right now, I am piloting um, a CFA model, which is an inflammation pain model in mice. My technicians have, um, and we've never done it in, in the core before. So we started, we, we just put some CFA in a paw. This causes inflammation in the animal's paw. And now we're testing it in several different pain tests. We can tell one, that the model is working. It is, you know, causing pain. But more importantly, that pain measure is showing up in the test we choose. So we can tell that, but also we can work out little things, right? We can make sure that the experiment's going to run smooth. This is important because you can do that OCD behavior and decrease your variability if you can pilot it out. So what is our animal? The most used animal is a mouse. Now, uh, interestingly enough, um, if you look here, this is a very, from a very old paper, but it shows that rats actually were more used. They're in the dark uh, black bar, I guess you'd say black um, line. Rats were used in the 60s, 70s, all the way up to the 2000s more than mice. But then after about 2010, mice really took over. And this was because of the amount of transgenic mice we have available to us nowadays. If you look here, I just did a quick, you know, PubMed search for behavior, mouse behavior and rat behavior, um, which is the same um, search that this study did. And it shows that mice are actually in half or rats are in half the publications that mice are. So they're, mice are being used twice as much as rats. Um, and this probably has something to do with uh, housing costs and, um, and, but mainly probably because of your transgenic animal. So well, we need to know about our mouse. I'm gonna concentrate on mice today because that's the most used. And that's the one we use in our core. And at Purdue, at least, that's probably three quarters of the, um, maybe more of the investigators use mice. So we need to know about different things. One, we need to know about the sensory system. So mice can't see very well. 
So if you look over here, you can see what the human sees in this picture. That is what the mouse actually sees. It's not a lot. They also cannot see red and probably red and oranges. They lack cones in that area um, of the of wavelengths. So they can see green and um, green and blues, but not higher wavelengths, which is why we use red light, by the way. If you were ever in a reverse light cycle, sometimes people use red light to, for us to see. The animals cannot see that light. Um, and I can go into reasons why they can, but we won't go into that right now. Mostly they cannot. Um, they, their, their vision is set up for nighttime. It is, it has lots of rods in the retina, which means they can see, um, in the periphery, um, uh, much better. Um, this allows them to see, um, movement better. And, um, they also, um, they also, um, see in black and wh white better than us. They also smell and hear a lot more than us because their vision is bad. They have whiskers. They have um, very good hearing. If you look here, I am showing you the sensory homunc homunculus, um, which you've seen probably many, many years ago in um, an introduction to neuroscience. Um, but you can see we have lots of um, sensory input in our hands and other areas. Whereas the mouse, it's really in the face and the head. So um, particularly a lot of the uh, whiskers are shown here. I have had mice do behavior just fine with one eye. It, it, it actually, they've done it. There is, you cannot tell who's who. Um, and so uh, you have to know that when you're testing your animal, really vision is not the number one thing they're gonna look at. It, it, it's really going to be smelling and um, hearing, but also they can see black and white images very well because they have the rods. So we wanna make our stimuli more black and white and not color, especially red or something like that. The, the, they are foragers, they are attracted to novelty. They do not like open spaces or elevated places. So you don't wanna, you know, hang them by the tail and bring them over. Um, they will not like that. That will be stress and stress creates variability, which kills statistical significances. So they also like anything um, that is quick over the top of their head. Um, that mimics a snake, by the way. And I've gotten bitten many times when I have done that. And I tell myself over and over again to be careful with that because it does stress them out. And they will, um, you know, that that is usually when I have seen mice bite. Um, they love fats and sweet. So in our experiments, um, when they are food restricted, we give them Nestle Quick which uh, they love sweets, but it's also strawberry Nestle quick because they like fruits. So you have to know kind of what a good, uh, a good, uh, a very, um, what they love, right? So it's got a good value to them so that they'll work for it. So another factor that is probably one of my uh, more dear to my heart is sex differences. I'm actually a researcher in sex differences, concentrating on Alzheimer's disorder um, and why there's so many women um, uh, with Alzheimer's um, disease compared to men. But on the whole, we should pay attention to biological sex. The NIH didn't enforce this for no reason. Unfortunately, it's not being enforced enough if you ask me and other sex difference researchers, but it causes problems in your research design. I am well aware, but you have to figure out when you need it. So when you're doing a test, you should look in the literature to see if there is a sex difference. If others have found no sex difference, you don't have to power for it. Maybe you just have to give, you know, a 50-50 um, sample to male to female, or maybe that will, will allow you only to do one sex. And so you'll have a lower number of animals. Um, but that's my big thing is that if you see a sex difference in the literature, you need to 
separate out the sexes and do your experiments that way. Yes, it doubles the end, but it's going to give you a more clear picture. And what I mean by separating them out is I mean factoring them for sex, putting it in your statistical analyses. There's a lot of people who think that just because they add females and males to the design, that's good enough. It's actually not because you'll never see the sex differences that are there. You'll only see, you'll only have a sample of both populations. That could go against you. And let me tell you how. When you do a factorial um, uh, analysis, an ANOVA, let's say, for sex differences, you see that um, you this is one this is one example of a sex difference effect. And so you see that the males and females both have an increase in pain here, but the effect is larger in females than it is in males. This is important for drug discovery. It's possible that drugs that are whatever, uh, whatever we're looking at here, whatever thing we wanna test, maybe it's better in females than males. Maybe the problem is worse in females. Maybe something exacerbates it. Maybe the females won't get, you know, there's all these other questions, but that needs to be paid attention when going to drug discovery. Then we have a sex by treatment effect, which is even more important because it's going to kill your significance if it happens. So if there is a something that happens where a male has a positive effect to it and a female has a negative effect to it, that's gonna wash out in your stats. So it's going to eliminate your differences. So an example here is a classic study by Tracy Shores that showed that giving stress to males and females alters how they learn um, the condition, they learn conditioning. So this is actually um, a trace condition eye blink test, not necessary to know all the details. Just know that an increase in conditioned responses is better memory. So what you see here is the males, when they're stressed out, they have better memory for, for the event, for, um, for the learning that they do at, during it. Um, whereas females have a decrease in learning when they are stressed out. Um, so this has been shown with different types of stress, um, chronic variable stress, other kind of sub-chronic um, stress. Um, you can actually read all about it in this um, nice uh, summary of her work over the years. This work is really early on in the 2000s, I believe, or even 1990s. So, uh, you know, think about this when you do your experiments, it, it, it might be good. What I tell people is that, you know, you, you can always just power small, right? So six females, six males for a non-behavior study um, or a behavior study, maybe eight per group. If you get a trend in the sex difference, you add more animals. If you don't, you don't. Um, it's kind of, it, that's the most simple way to do it without spending so much money and time. So um, I also want to say that sex does not equal gender. A mouse and a rat does not have gender. Um, um, I, I, I Actually, I don't know if they do. I do not think they do. I cannot ask them. Um, sex is biological sex. That is what we should refer to when using animal models. So we also have the estrus cycle, which some people probably cringe because this could increase your variability um, drastically. It also could eliminate validity. And um, if you see here, this is just a representation of the estrus cycle that this is a rat estrus cycle, but it's very similar to a mouse. They, um, they, the two cycles are very similar. This is the rat, this is the human. You can see that the peaks of both estrogen and progesterone comes, they come similarly. Now, the mouse and the rat have a four day cycle. So every four days you're getting a large peak of estrogen, which does change responses to learning, to stress, and a lot of other things. Progesterone as well is another peak slightly after the estrogen peak. That's going to change things 
um, like seizure susceptibility um, and other things because of its um, its metabolite um, that binds to the GABA receptor. So these things you should keep in mind. They might not make a difference in your studies, but keep them in mind when you do your interpretations. This is an experiment I did at IU um, in 2004. I have this published from Dr. Shaker and I's work. And Dr. Shaker really uh, did a lot of social interaction tests. Um, and I came into the lab wanting to see the sex differences in his model. This is back in 2000. So boy, has all of this changed. But what I what I looked at was estrogen replacement. So these were overactomized animals. I gave them estrogen. And I looked at what um, the elevated plus maze told me. And it told me, it, it, it uh, reinforced my hypothesis, which was estrogen was and anxiolytic, which is what we thought all the time and people had anecdotally said. Um, now we do know it is anxiolytic, but um, this was a while ago. So we found this nice effect in the um, open arm entries in an elevated plus maze. So we went on to social interaction and unfortunately we found that estrogen actually caused less social, less interaction, which means more anxiety-like behavior. Now, what does that mean? This other test just showed that there was an increase in anxiety-like behavior. Um, so we were really surprised at this and didn't know what was going on. So we tried to block it with pharmacologically with a um, anxiolytic alzoprimal, Alzapram, <laughs> Xanax, basically, um, and um, so then uh, we we gave it um, to reverse uh, the um, the effect, um, and it did. So um, so we kind of are wondering why this happened and why it's anxiogenic and we can reverse it with alprazolam. Well, I went to a meeting at Lilly actually, and because um, I did a lot of this work at Lilly and, uh, and one gentleman said, hey, you need to look at sexual receptivity. Um, and uh, then I looked at sexual receptivity by just making them more sexually receptive by adding progesterone. And um, I found that it further dro dropped. And basically, because the animal was sexually receptive, the animal didn't want to socialize with another female. It was looking for a mate. So that was simple. This is the problem that you can get without looking at these small um, differences in um, behavior and why they're happening. So um, transgenic animals have their own, you know, and um, sensory and motor deficits. We don't always test for this, but it is a good idea to test for activity at least. Um, we, I have a story real quick about a sodium channel knockout mouse that will just walk off tables. It has no problem. You put it on a, uh, a, a bench or desktop, it will just walk off the ledge. And so it cannot be used in elevated plus maze. It can't be used in a lot of other tests because of this problem. We don't know if it has no depth perception or it is just fearless. Um, we also have a lot of off-target test um, effects that you need to keep in mind with your mouse. Um, yeah, my video is not working, but this animal circles around and um, around and around. And uh, basically uh, it, uh, I see if I can do it there. No, um, it, it basically circles around and around and around. And sometimes it's because they can't hear. So if they have um, hearing issues, they will circle, which is an off an example of an off target effect. Now in transgenic models, there's also leakage and genetic drift. This has been killing me to, um, recently because I it seems, but I don't know for sure that um, some of the AD models have some leakage over to the wild types. Um, the wild types have deficits in cognition when compared to a regular C57. That decreases the um, ability to get significance, right? If, our, if our, our wild type control is not behaving normally, then we have a problem. The genetic drip is another thing. Animal models get 
just bred over and over and over again, and genetic drift will happen, which may lose your phenotype altogether. Oh, there's my animal. It's gonna circle and circle and circle and circle. So what else do we need to look for? We need to look at source, sources of variability. Um, unfortunately, even though mice are inbred, it doesn't mean they're identical in behavior. Um, it's, it's a very uh, inbred, I, I'm not talking that inbred's bad. I'm just saying that there's still individual variability in behavior. I say there's more individual variability in behavior than there is um, yeah, variability in um, like biochem tests, Western blood protein measurements, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's there's many reasons for this that could happen that you can try and control, but some of them you can't. Um, one thing is the moms. Now, um, there are good and bad moms. And the same thing happens in mice that they do in humans in the when you're rearing, when you're the individual is being reared, that environment is very important. And this maternal support is very important. The animals that are coming from a bad mom will have more stress, more corticosteroid um, release, um, and they have some learning deficits that have been shown in many studies. So good moms on the offside have better behaviorally intact animals. So we we can't we can't like stop this. If we notice it, we can stop the mating of that line, that particular line, right? So um, if there's a bad mom, you don't want to then breed that offspring because the offspring is going to be a bad mom too. So you got to keep that in mind. Housing and bedding is very important. Um, me and Deb Hickman just did this study. We use some disposable caging as well as reusable, reusable being the same old Allentown cages you guys have all seen. The disposable ones are quite clear, um, meaning the plastic is clear so that there's a lot of light pouring in. And we thought it might be more anxious, you know, have some more anxiety like behaviors in the animals. We tested this in different ways. Um, one was just in the open field and um, you actually see that in disposable cages here, both the orange and the blue, um, they actually explored more in the open field than the regular reusable cages. And um, even more, the alpha dry explored a tiny bit more, although not statistically significant, um, than the beta cob um, animal. And then we looked at object exploration. So just exploring an object, this will test anxiety. So anxiety-like behavior. So if you approach an object quicker, or for, um, for more time, you will, it, it, it shows that you're a little less anxious and it's motivation for the task. So you kind of want this, right? Um, so the alpha dry animals actually in the disposable cages actually perform outperformed all the rest of the groups here. So bedding matters, housing matters. Actually, I would say bedding matters a lo lot more than we think. Um, so when moving animals, make sure that the bedding is the same. You can control that, right? And it doesn't have to be that beta cob is not what you use, let alpha dries better. No, you just have to keep it the same way throughout your whole experiments. Now, other things can be can do pro have problems, sense, loud sounds, vibrations. All this stuff you can't control, but you should write it down just in case your um, results come out a little funky. This is um, uh, always a, a, a surprise to people. Um, you must handle mice just like you must handle rats. Um, and what I mean by that is you go into the room and you kind of get to know your mouse. Um, you hold the mouse so the mouse gets used to your smell, gets used to a person, decreases the amount of stress it's going to have when you put it in an animal, um, in a behavioral thing that um, most of you have probably heard before. Um, but that handler actually in, um, increases variability. It's been shown that male and female handlers have different results. And you can see here that um, 
the corticosteroid levels are higher when a male handler ha has the animal versus when a female has an animal. So uh, this also translates uh, when a woman is wearing a shirt of a man. So we think it has something to do with probably um, pheromones or due to testosterone, something like that. Um, and this also translates, this high stress level actually translates in um, in in actual behavior. So this is showing pain responses and um, the animals have a higher threshold for pain when it's with the males versus the females. So this is just an it, just a, a way to show you that it depends if a male or a female is handling it. Now, I don't keep this, I, I don't, I, I can't control for this in my lab because I have lots of undergrads and they are male and female, um, but uh, mixing them up in the same study, I'm careful about. So validity, I've kind of touched on some of this, but um, you know, our tests have to be valid, but whether or not they're completely valid is another question. There's predictive, predictive validity, which usually means pharmacologically valid, um, meaning that if you give a drug that, that helps in humans to this model or this test, it should react the same. An example of this is the four swim test. The force twin test, you give antidepressant um, drugs and you will find a decrease in struggling or swimming. I mean, an increase in struggling and swimming, saying that it's less helpless. The same, th the but this test, the four swim test, is not a good face. Doesn't have good face validity. I mean, just because the animal floats more, that means they're more depressed. They have depressive like behavior. It doesn't really quite work out, and it doesn't look like it mimics the human condition. Now, construct availability is just something that it's correlating with the uh, apathophysiology or ideology of a disease. So, um, so it's, you know, the pathways that you know are involved. If you, if you alter them, you're gonna alter the functioning on the animal behavior task. Now, one good mo um, new system that has come about um, in the last 10 years is the Busey Succida um, touchscreen systems. We have them in our core and so does Katie at IU School of Medicine. Um, these tests um, are made to have all both construct validity, face validity, and predictive val validity. And they've pretty much panned out. Um, the face validity you think, you know, an animal is pressing a screen for a reward. Now, is that really what happens in the clinic. Well, it's as close as we can get because the paradigms that are available for this touch screen are actually those in the CAN-TAB testing that we use for Alzheimer's disease, ADHD, and a lot of other neuro disorders. So this is an example of a condition placement task. You'll see that, um, that the animal will ignore the stimuli that doesn't, um, that does give him, he responds when he does get a reward and he just did that. Um, and he'll do that on three trials. You see, he does this really well. He basically is looking at the screen waiting for the next one to come and he goes at it. Now he only has a second, I think 1.5 seconds to respond or that goes off the screen and he misses his, his chance. But this is very similar to what we do in children when we test them for ADHD on a nice little iPad or whatever. So there's a ton of little of different touch screens tests. And like I said, they mimic uh, the can tab. There are, there are problems with these um, and I could go on forever about that. Um, but funding agencies, as I wrap up that part of the talk, funding agencies are paying attention to this. The Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation actually makes you fill out an animal studies questionnaire that wants you to think about all of these things I just said. Um, validity of your test. Is your model valid? How many animals are you going to use? What kind of statistical analysis are you doing? Are you controlling for sex? Things like that. So just know that it's important when going for, for grant funding. 
Now, new technologies, and I wish I could have stopped talking and talk about this a little more, but we're just beginning to do it. So um, the new technologies that we've been, we've been seeing that comes out are for brain behavior relationships. And this is actually not necessarily, it's, it's correlating, but in real time, you're seeing the brain activity change with the behavior. Um, the first thing to come out were wireless, um, no wireless, they're not wireless, um, uh, calcium imaging, many microscopes that get mounted to the head of a mouse um, while the animal is moving around in space. And this has been used, I think they've been around for about 10 years now, maybe more. And this has been used very well so that you can see when drug activity is happening in a certain area of the brain due to what the animal is doing. This has done a lot of social, um, a lot of social behavior and such. We also have two photon imaging in a head fix system. As you can see here, this little guy is in is on a ball and he's running, but he had his head is fixed to a microscope so that imaging can happen. This gives you all sorts of options. Um, you can get a very deep learn, you can get a lot of, of structural resolution out of this. Um, and so that's why this you know, we still do this um, compared to this because this is only a one photon approach. The two photon approach is going to let you ask more questions. We also have um, virtual reality systems here. Um, they usually look like this where the animal is on a, is somewhat a ball or, or something to run on and there's uh, a movie or something going on around them. And then there's also ones where the mouse is actually wearing goggles like we do in VR setups. And this has just been designed. It's it's not uh, been used very frequently, but um, the work here has been done um, by Daniel Dombeck and Dombeck and Do Dr. Dombeck will be here um, at Purdue for the Big Ten Neuroscience meeting uh, in June. So if you're interested in this kind of technology, he will be giving a, a talk um, on what he's been doing recently. Now, machine learning is our new thing. And this is actually where we think it's going to be at. More likely, this is going to be faster. We can look at little behaviors in mice. It can, pattern recognition can be, um, it is usually better in a machine than in a human. Um, and it will just give us another tool to look at behavior specifically and see if we can find bench uh, biomarkers for the diseases so we can just pump the drugs out keep that, you know, put that on there and hopefully it works. We can make it a little bit more standardized than our old approaches. So the first one to come out is deep lab cut. And this was to measure track postures uh, or measure and track postures um, in animals um, to look at small behaviors. And this has really been helpful. A lot of people use it. Um, it's uh, easy. It's Python. It's 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 programming. Yes, in Python. But um, from what I see and 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 do it, it's pretty. Um, a person can learn it. It just takes time. Um, it increases the efficiency of looking at different behaviors you're interested in. The Mars system is another one that has been designed specifically for resident intruder or social interactions, um, resident intruder test aggression. And um, it's very time saving going through all the videos, testing it and scoring every little behavior. Um, and you do this in slow motion. So you, you can imagine you have 50 animals in a, in a study and, uh, you know, lots of time, lots of effort, lots of money. So this is a system that's going to, to speed all of that up. Um, and it also now is joined with another system called Bento, which uh, it basically the Mars part of it recognizes the patterns of behavior, and then it matches it by, by using Bento with the imaging data, which is calcium imaging or what have you, um, um, when you um, what you're looking at. Now, we've gone into unsupervised machine learning. So new systems have come out that 
actually will recognize patterns for you. You don't have to put anything in. You put the video, the program runs, it finds the patterns of behavior, it finds what the animal is doing, and it associates it with imaging patterns. So you can tell which cell that might be re um, responsible for that particular behavior. Um, this is very powerful. This is very fast. Um, all of this can speed up um, our, our research. Um, the B soy, uh, I don't know if it's soy system or not, <laughs> um, but it showed the it shows that uh, grooming is this this particular type of grooming is 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 um, correlated with a particular cell in the striatum, um, and this was important maybe in Tourette's or Huntington's disease um, studies. So uh, getting down to the population of the cells that can be affected uh, by drug treatments to solve some of these diseases that are unsolved now um, could be quite powerful. There's also um, two photon imaging um, and facial expressions that have just uh, recently came out. Um, and this is um, um, where they have a camera looking at the mouse and they also have a head fixed microscope for their two photon imaging, sorry. And, um, and they have a ball that the animal is is on and they basically give it bad things to drink and and then watch the facial expression and then watch in this case um what what what's different cells light up um and light up i mean calcium imaging and they can actually find face coating cells and sensory coating cells and there's a little bit of overlap in these these different um, tastes and and things and uh, facial expressions, but it does a pretty good job, and it may show us more. It may make us answer more interesting questions, right? In basic science and in drug discovery. So these things I'm talking about are very important for funding as well, because the NIMH is not really a fan of behavior, basically. Um, they are now requiring two or more behavioral tests, not use of one, which is a good thing. We've talked about that. Basically, uh, one may have different interpretations and you should really uh, look at both um, and or more, one or more. The um, Also, they're they're looking for investigators to develop and or use this fine-grained real-time measurements of behavior and associate them with brain um, activity. So this is actually in a notice. So, and this was back in 2019. So these newer, the NIMH feels that the new behavioral, um, brain, brain behavioral um, systems are more powerful um, than our old, um, regular water maze, whatever, uh, um, things that we've been using. This is not for every agency, but I've had a few colleagues that have been a little bit upset about this. Um, and, uh, and, and so NINDS does not have this notice. So, um, a lot of behavioral people are actually switching to NINDS, unfortunately. So conclusions, I'm not going to go through all these, you know what I've just said. Um, but uh, pay attention to your mouse and make sure that you know that you're testing what you're supposed to be testing. Um, get to know what an, an animal is going to do and what it's supposed to do. Um, use a core facility um, if you don't have the staff or um, the know-how or, you know, uh, in the room. It, sometimes it's just down to space on where you put the behavioral equipment. Um, I think it's I think uh, it's it's much more efficient um, for you than learning all of these variabilities. We have very good internal validity, meaning that we our tests do the same thing every time because we do the same thing every time. We control for the same vari variability. So we also hope that machine learning and um, and other methods of AI will will continue to develop so that we can kind of get rid of some of this variability and 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 efficiency because behavior takes such a long time. 
Um, and uh, that's about it. I have taken an entire amount of time, but if there's any questions, I'd love to love to hear. Thank you so much, Wendy. Uh, wonderful, wonderful synopsis of what you do and your core technology. Um, we will open it up for any questions. I have not received any on the chat, uh, but anybody I think can unmute themselves and ask away. What's What do you think if somebody wanted to get started, what are some of the, like, should they be thinking about the design of the experiment? Should they be thinking about regulatory? Should they be coming to talk to you first and <laughs> decide what yeah. are some of the most important pieces to get going and get started? Yeah. So I think both Katie and I actually do a lot of drug drug screening uh, for internal faculty, but also external um, drug companies. So um, internal faculty usually uh, have a question in mind, whether it be drug discovery or a question about a disease or something else. And what I ask is people to give me the research question and their hypothesis. That's really all I need to know. And then we can go on from there and we can talk about the disease or whatever you're looking at, whatever you're measuring to make sure that we get the right test. I would, I always give a free consultation. So you can always, you know, schedule a meeting with me that I can give you my opinion. I also, I don't even charge for this, but I do a lot of mentoring to students and help them with their projects. Um, if they need any help, particularly in getting an animal to do what you want it to do um, and, and learning and things like that. Um, yeah, just, you know, contact me um, and um, I'd be glad to talk to you about any project that you think you might or you know you will. Or even if I don't do all the studies, you know, I can train your people. Um, we also have uh, technicians almost for hire. So my technician can come into your lab and do an experiment either with, you know, with your equipment or um, we can have your graduate student in our core and one of my technicians will help your, um, your uh, graduate student go through the testing. So that's another service that we are offering that has been very popular. We have a comment from Valerie Willis, who says, thank you, Dr. Koss, for an extremely interesting and incredibly informative talk. Does your core facility offer tours? Yes, sure. No problem. Anytime. Yeah, just contact me, wkoss at purdue.edu. Yeah, be glad to give you a tour. I actually like giving a tour. I built the core from scratch, and so it's very much my baby. So any kind of, anytime I get to like, you know, kind of show off, I guess. Um, the, the Purdue Institute of Integrative Neuroscience was very, very generous with its startup. And so we have lots of equipment to choose from. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Wendy Koss uh, and Valerie Willis says, thank you, I'll be in touch. Uh, thank you so much for for spending the afternoon with us, uh, telling us about your animal behavior core at Purdue University. Uh, this has been part again of the Indiana CTSI Research Core Technology Seminar. We thank everybody for taking time to listen and to participate in this program. Uh, remember the ATP is here to can help you connect with core facilities such as the one that we heard about today. And uh, for more information, please look up Indiana CTSI ATP Access Technology Program. Have a great afternoon. Have Thank fun. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.